Welcome to the webinar, Feelings of the Heart, Addressing Mental Health in Heart Failure Care. We will get started in just a minute. For those of you who have just joined, welcome to the webinar, Feelings of the Heart, Addressing Mental Health in Heart Failure Care. When you join today's webinar, you're gonna be joining in computer audio. If you prefer to listen via your telephone, simply select the phone call option and the dial-in number will auto-populate. If you want to live tweet or to share some learnings from today with your network, please include the handle for Heart and Stroke and for Heart Life Canada, um, along with the uh, Heart Month hashtag. Okay, we're gonna get started. This webinar is being recorded and it will be available for you um, afterwards to view. You can access the webinar on the event, uh, the event page for the Heart and Stroke YouTube channel and through Stroke Best Practice website. After the webinar, all attendees will be emailed invitations to complete an evaluation, which will lead to a certificate in participation. My name is Amanda Nash. I am the project lead for lived experience engagement and support with Heart and Stroke. I'm joined today by Mark Baines, co-founder of Heart Life Foundation. We will be your moderators over the next hour. Today's webinar is hosted by Heart and Stroke and Heart Life. And we want to begin by acknowledging the indigenous peoples of all the lands that we are on today. While we are meeting on a virtual platform, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the land which we all call home. From coast to coast to coast, we acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of all Inuit, Métis, and First Nations people. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and our responsibility to improve relationships between nations and to improve our own understanding of local Indigenous peoples and their culture. We're gathered here today because of our shared commitment to equity, including health equity and reconciliation. And I encourage you to reflect on what that means for you in your work and in your lives from coast to coast. Thank you for joining today for our Heart Month webinar, Feelings of the Heart, Addressing Mental Health in Heart Failure Care. Heart and Stroke and Heart Life work hard to increase and support um, awareness around heart failure, to drive health systems change, to fund research, and to advocate to ensure that people living with heart failure receive the best care and treatment throughout their journey. Heart failure is a serious and growing concern. In Canada, 750,000 people are currently living with heart failure, and 100,000 people are diagnosed with this complex and incurable condition every year. Heart failure can place a significant strain on people living with the condition, their families, and their caregivers. Unfortunately, there are many factors along the journey that can lead to mental health consequences. Today, we'll take a deeper dive into these issues and some of the strategies to alleviate them. People living with heart failure, as well as healthcare professionals who treat them, have reported that mental health supports and services are a significant gap in the heart failure system of care. The purpose of this webinar is to raise awareness, to normalize, to educate, to encourage healthcare providers to incorporate mental health into routine care, and to encourage people living with heart failure to raise concerns about their mental health with their healthcare team and to seek the support that they need. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Mark, who can get us started. Thank you so much, Amanda. I appreciate it. My name is Mark Baines. I'm the co-founder of the Heart Life Foundation, as well as a person with lived experience with heart failure of 10 years and a heart transplant recipient. It's my honor to, to be on this webinar with this great panel of speakers and moderating with Amanda. And mental health is a topic I, I know, first and foremost, was was not really addressed when I was diagnosed with heart failure. It wasn't until we started the Heart Life Foundation and did our work with heart and stroke that it really came to the limelight. So really looking forward to this today. The objectives for today, we are going to describe the current landscape and challenges in addressing mental health in part of heart failure care. So taking that real holistic approach to it, discussing opportunities to really normalize and, and integrate mental health into practice, everyday practice throughout the care continuum, right? To really inform care and create better outcomes for people. To identify practical actions for both healthcare professionals and people living with heart failure to address mental health. So when you leave this session today, you'll have these tools, these resources to really take charge of your mental health. And then really improve health outcomes, uh, like I said, with practical tips, tools, and implementation strategies. I've heard a few of these speakers in the past and we're really in for a great webinar. So 
honored to be here. Uh, just a reminder, we do have the question bar again. Amanda alluded to it earlier. We will be monitoring it and we will take questions at the very end of the webinar. Thank you so much. And I'm gonna move on to introducing our first speaker. Oh, here's a very high level of our speakers. Sorry, I, I jumped the gun, but um, you know, Jillian Co. this is an honor. Jillian's both a colleague of mine, a friend and co-founder of the HeartLife Foundation. Dr. Code is an assistant professor in the Department of Curriculum and Pedagogy in the Faculty of Education at the University of British Columbia. Dr. Code is an educator, a learning scientist specializing in student and patient agency and its role in learning technology, applied research design, and knowledge translation. Dr. Code's interdisciplinary research is funded by Social Sciences and Humanitarian Research Council and the Canadian Institute of Health Research, the CIHR. Dr. Cole's most important role, however, is that of a heart failure survivor and two-time heart transplant recipient. She always holds that over me. I have one transplant, she has two transplants. I guess she wins. In, in July 2016, Dr. Code co-founded the HeartLife Foundation, Canada's first and only patient-led heart failure organization with myself and Dr. Sean Varani. The mission of HeartLife is to transform the quality of life for people living with heart failure by engaging, educating, and empowering patients through a national network now connected to a global community of patient-led organizations. In October 2019, along with myself and Sean Varani, HeartLife was awarded the prestigious Dr. Harold Siegel Award of Merit from the Canadian Cardiovascular Society in recognition of their significant contribution to the promotion of cardiovascular health for Canadians. Dr. Code is an active keynote speaker and is the first ever patient and education editor for the Journal of Cardiac Failure, the Heart Failure Society of America's flagship journal. Jillian, with that, I'll pass it on to you. Thank you, Mark. It's embarrassing to hear all of those things, um, but it's been an, the honor of my life to be uh, with you on this journey. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Just uh, advancing the slide here. I, in my talk is entitled Fe Feelings of the Heart Life, Mental Health and the, and the Lived Experience. And I'm going to talk to you about uh, some of my experience, but also uh, some of the experience of our members um, and what um, Heart Life has done um, and we are hopefully doing to, uh, to engage people and to help, help support people. Next slide, please. Okay, well, that's too far forward, but okay. Anyway, um, so before I begin, I would like to acknowledge that um, that HeartLife is actually uh, based out of Vancouver, and that is on the traditional ancestral territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people. Uh, I myself am uh, currently located on Vancouver Island in Victoria, and um, this is uh, on the uh, traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Lekwungen speaking people and the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations. Um, and it's really important, um, as Amanda was saying, that we do recognize um, and understand the uh, the colonial trauma that um, that uh, colonization um, has has uh, has taken um, on um, our I say are um, on on indigenous people, and um, and that is really uh, important because it also is pervasive throughout the healthcare system as well, and so we really need to acknowledge and uh, try to understand how we can overcome these barriers. Next slide, please. Um, so, like I said, <laughs> my name is Jillian, and um, on the this is my personal website, which is at Jillian.ca, and um, I share this because uh, I want to reinforce that um, although you know I do have have had heart failure and two heart transplants, um, I am more than just uh, just the diagnosis, as I know everyone on this call is as well, uh, those with lived experience. And so it's really important that we recognize that we are we are complete people and um, that we can uh, continue on with our lives, although we might need to make some adjustments. And, uh, and I continue to do that. Next slide, please. Um, I'm not going to go through my entire journey because if I do, it will take up 
a very, very long time, but I will touch base um, really on the one, uh, the most recent event that has uh, uh, really set into motion um, uh, some, re some trauma and PTSD and everything. Um, shortly after founding HeartLife, um, this is me and my husband um, in the, uh, when we moved to UBC, um, I participated in a number of events, obviously with Heart and Stroke, but also with with HeartLife um, Hacking Health and 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 those items there. And January 9th, 2017, is an important date because that was the day that I had my first uh, coronary vasospasm. spasm, and I didn't know what it was, but it was a serious uh, pain in my chest. And being a transplant recipient, you aren't supposed to feel any of these any of that pain, and so um, it was really uh, concerning. And um, I had a test on March 6th that confirmed um, that, in fact, what I was having was a coronary vasospasm. So those women with lived experience um, on the call um, will recognize that there are uh, a number of conditions that uh, seem to be unique to women. And this was one of them. Um, and then um, in December of 2017, um, while visiting my family in Edmonton, I had a heart attack. Next slide, please. And during that time, um, it was found that my um, every artery in my new beautiful donated heart was was blocked. And um, they told me on the table um, that uh, I would need another transplant. And as you can imagine, this uh, you know having to go through it once is uh, certainly enough, but being told that you have to go through it again um, was the most uh, earth-shattering experience for me, and shattered is the probably the best description um, that, that, that I could use because it really uh, exploded my entire um, psyche, my worldview, my everything. Um, and I was just so upset because I did not want to put my husband through that again, and um, I didn't want to put my family through that again. And so I was really coming to terms with um, that, you know, uh, I might not live through this. Um, next slide, please. So uh, thankfully, though, um, I did return to, from from uh, Edmonton to Vancouver. And uh, on January 22nd, I was told that they had a heart for me. And uh, overnight on um, into January 23rd, I had my second heart transplant. And um, there was uh, everything is going well and I'm four years out now. Um, one of the things that um, I knew right away uh, going into my surgery and um, even when I arrived back in Vancouver was um, I needed the, um, the mental health support. And so I immediately asked, I figured my doctors, they've got, they know what they're doing. Um, but I asked specifically to see a psychiatrist and I asked specifically to have um, to see a psychologist and um, my psychologist that I was seeing privately um, was allowed to come in and see me regularly as I was waiting. And so it was um, really, really important to sort of help support me through this process. Next slide, please. But one thing that this whole experience has taught me is that um, uh, you know, heart failure, transplant, all of it, um, and I think we can all relate to everything that has happened over <laughs> the past couple of years, is that um, this quote really does describe it well, that the root of suffering is resisting the certainty that no matter what the circumstances, uncertainty is all we truly have. And um, this is from Pima Chodron, and she is a, um, a Buddhist nun, actually, who practices out of Nova Scotia. Um, and she has a number of really amazing books. And one of them that um, has been very important to me is um, Comfortable with Uncertainty. And um, recognizing and, 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 and facing that and um, accepting that has been a really important part of my mental health journey because we don't really know um, what's going to happen, it's, but what we can do is take control of what we currently have um, and, and work towards a future together. Um, and Mark has been incredibly important in that and HeartLife has been incredibly important. Um, I think we founded HeartLife because we saw a gap, um, but it's been, I think, just as much a support for Mark and I as it has for, um, for many others. Next slide, please. 
So I want to talk about, um, I could go on into, I don't have a lot of time, um, but I could talk, I want to talk about um, our, some of the projects that, that Heartlife has been engaging in. And one of them is this, um, the Unbundled Learning Project that I'm running um, out of my, my lab at UBC. Um, and we are working together to really try to tell the patient side of, of uh, the, um, the mental health journey and that includes social support, um, but also how we, uh, we leverage each other as powerful others um, to help us learn um, because there's a lot of informal learning that takes place um, in, in our groups. And so one of the things that we did is, is we uh, conducted a survey and um, we're in the process of, of writing, up, writing this up, um, but I wanted to share some uh, preliminary results uh, that I think are quite telling. Next slide, please. One of the surveys that, that we ran was the um, Generalized Anxiety um, Disorder Survey. And it was only, it's uh, only seven questions. Um, and uh, I can give you the citation for that, but if you just Google GAD-7, um, it, it will come up. Um, and what our members told us um, is that there are a number of people who, who say that, you know, um, as according to the GAD-7, don't, don't really have a lot of anxiety. Um, but the vast majority of, um, of our members actually do. Um, so some suffer from mild anxiety, so it's about 39%. But we have some who are um, really on the moderate to severe, to severe side of the, of the anxiety scale. And um, I know these are numbers and they don't necessarily uh, can't reflect the, entire, the entirety of that story, but that's nine, you know, we say, let's say nine and eight. And so that's like 17% of um, the people in our group, if this is a representative sample, um, really have moderate to severe anxiety about, about their, um, their, their heart journey. And so um, it's really, really important that uh, people take notice of this. And so um, when it comes out, um, everybody, you know, it will be blasted and everybody will, will see it on, on our social channels. But I wanted to, um, to, to demonstrate that. So what we've done, oh, sorry, next slide, please. <laughs> what we've done um, is we have uh, developed also a patient journey and the patient journey um, uh, also is a qualitative um, aspect of this and it reflects our um, uh, the, the life before diagnosis, the diagnosis and living with heart failure and that it is a very complicated journey. Um, but one of the things um, throughout that is that uh, mental health plays a big role. Um, and since I'm almost out of time, I want to uh, jump ahead. If we can jump ahead to the um, slide 15, please. Um, that living with heart failure um, aspect um, is really, really difficult. And um, the mental health aspect of this, um, thank you, next slide. And you can download the patient journey from our website. Um, but I wanted to emphasize this, that the emotional, the emotional distress that a diagnosis can cause and that it can continue on. And um, there's so many elements of this journey that are, that are complex. And the most important aspect, um, at least that, that we found through our, um, our own journeys, but also through um, our membership is really communicating one message is that you are not alone. And there are other people that are um, on this journey and you know, uh, not everybody's journey is the same, but it is, it is important um, to, to actually come to a place in the Heartlife, um, our Facebook group, as well as we have the My Heartlife app for those who aren't on Facebook, um, but for those who are as well, um, to, download and access and um, just be amongst a community of people with lived experience and um, that in and of itself is really really important. Um, so I'm just going to stop there um, because I, I'm running out of time and I want to give um, our other presenters enough uh, enough time to to share their uh, their slides as well. Um, but it really really is important and so for more information just visit our website heartlife.ca. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Code. Um, I apologize for the technical difficulty. Um, there's just a slight delay in the slide in the slide deck, so uh, we will we will try and continue to fix that. But um, thank you for your patience, um, Dr. Code. Your strength, your vulnerability, your dedication to this important work it's it's so inspiring. Um, I look forward to to continued discussion, and we're going to save all questions until the end. But we'll bring you back at the end of the presentation and and continue this really important discussion. So thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Vidya Raj. So Dr. Raj, if you could please join me on, on the screen. While we wait for her to get loaded up, um, Dr. Raj completed her psychiatric residency training and a fellowship in consultation liaison psychiatry at the Vanderbilt University in Nashville. She moved to Calgary in 2014 and she's the directory of, director of the Calgary Hearts and Minds Clinics, which she founded in September 2016. This program provides psychiatric consultation and short-term treatment for patients referred by any cardiology service in Calgary and the surrounding area. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Raj. Uh, you're welcome. It's a real pleasure to be asked to uh, attend. Thank you for asking me. Okay, so if you could move uh, to the next, uh, next slide, that would be great. Okay, um, so I'm an assistant professor with a cross appointment in both psychiatry and uh, cardiac sciences at the University of Calgary. Um, I am the clinical director of a, a clinic where um, my colleague cardiologists can refer any patients who have any kind of heart disease, who have any mental health issues that, that need to be addressed. And I provide consultation and, and treatment and will refer on if any further services are needed. Um, I just want to say, I don't have any conflicts of interest. Um, I'm going to start this presentation um, and, and I just want to tell you, it's going to be quite technical. It's, it's just based on what research exists um, at this point. And I think it's very important that you know that. Um, you, many of you actually live with this or see your relatives live with the consequences of depression um, with heart failure. But what I actually want to focus on is, do you know that there is a body of research literature? It's slow, but it's catching up with what you see in terms of experience, um, and, and it's very, very important. The first question I'm going to address is, why should we actually care if somebody with heart failure or heart disease is depressed? Um, so I will say that most of the literature started off in approximately the 80s, um, and it was not very, um, it did not distinguish heart failure from the rest of the cardiovascular diseases. So it lumped all comers together. So the initial data that I often will present um, is, is gene a general signal, both heart in heart failure, um, post-MI, angina patients, people who've had a cabbage, uh, people with valve disease, all lumped together. But more recently, there is more specific data on heart failure patients specifically. And whenever I have that, I will actually present that to you as well. Okay, so with all that, why should you care? So for generally patients with heart disease who are depressed, um, right, they, they will consistently have a reduced quality of life. Um, about two, two times less likely to rate themselves as doing okay as somebody who is not depressed with heart failure. Um, there is a very important and consistent signal um, in any depressed patient with heart disease, which says the more depressed they are, um, the more likely they are to have another cardiovascular event. Um, large bodies of data, consistent evidence. So it's particularly shocking, twice as likely to actually die if you're depressed with heart disease as if you're not depressed. Um, this relationship is not a direct one. Um, it's probably a combination of multiple different issues that that kind of fail or, or you don't do as well with if you're depressed um, these include things like actually your some of your inflammatory mediators in your body will increase in your in a depressed state um, there is reduced heart rate variability in folks who are depressed which is a signal of reduced heart health a vague one um, another really important one is that um, someone who's depressed is two to three times less likely to actually take care of themselves very, very important in uh, heart patients because we actually need them to take better care of themselves. So patients need, we want them to participate more in cardiac rehab. We want them to take their medications, including their cardiac drugs. 
And guess what? If you're depressed, you're two to three times less likely to do those things. Um, it won't surprise you to know that altogether this increases healthcare costs in the rate of 15 to 53 percent in different studies in the next five years, simply if you're depressed with heart disease compared with if you're not. Okay. And uh, this slide has been already given away a lot of my data, but specifically now more recent data in heart failure patients who are depressed. Um, patients who have heart failure who are depressed, about one in five, which is two to three times higher than the general population uh, baseline. Um, interestingly, if we look at this another way, um, in a healthy adult who is depressed, they, are, they have an 18% risk of being diagnosed with heart failure in the next seven years compared with someone who isn't depressed. Just, just food for thought. It's generally depression is also not good for you. Um, depression is also in heart failure patients is linked to a twofold increased risk of death, subsequent cardiovascular events, and much more frequent hospitalizations for decompensated heart failure. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so I hope I've made the case as to why depression is important to address. Um, the second thing now is, so what exists in terms of what do we do about it? So the American Heart Association actually issued official guidelines in 2008, um, stating that at any opportunity given, patients with heart disease should be screened for depression. Um, so uh, this is done reasonably simply. There's a questionnaire, um, a yes or no questionnaire that's self-rated by a patient called the PHQ-2. Um, it simply asks, in the last two weeks, um, have you been bothered with either of these two symptom clusters? The first is little interest or pleasure in doing things, and the second is feeling down, depressed, or hopeless. And on that initial screening tool, if a patient indicates yes to either or both, they go on to the next level of screening. Next slide, please. This level of screening is called is a more detailed self-rated questionnaire called the PHQ-9. Um, you, you may see this in clinic sometimes. Um, it asks a patient to actually do a bit more than yes or no. They actually have to rate their symptoms now. So these nine symptoms listed here are the symptoms we, um, we ask when we're trying to diagnose someone with depression. So a patient is asked to rate in the last two weeks, how often have you been bothered by any of these nine symptoms? And um, this, they're asked to score from zero, which is not at all, all the way up to three, which is nearly every day. So for each of these nine questions, you then have a rating. And if you sum all those together, next slide, um, if the value is 10 or more, this indicates that a formal mental health uh, referral is indicated and that patient should really be evaluated because they may benefit from treatment. So next slide. And we, we now come to kind of the crux of the presentation, which is the state of the art in terms of data as to what actually makes a difference uh, in terms of treatment in this population. So um, the initial signal came actually in the post-MI population um, that, was, that was studied more than the heart failure population initially. But in a, in a very decent large study of post-MI patients who are depressed, um, the HUNT-3 study, um, placing these patients on an exercise program was associated with a robust, um, statistically significant, moderate improvement in depressive symptoms. So it's a very important finding. Um, I should also note, importantly, that your cardiologist wants, wants exercise to be part of the plan too. There's a lot of amazing data that um, your physical health parameters will improve with exercise as well. For example, the SMILE2 study quoted here uh, in 2016 just took healthy depressed patients and put them through an exercise program and then measured various cardiovascular markers of health, such as the intimal thickness of the, of the vessels, um, uh, and um, lipid levels, and found that both actually reduced in correlation with uh, exercise. So, you know, exercise in every way, if you get nothing else from this talk, is a winner. Um, it will improve mental health symptoms and uh, physical health parameters pretty robustly and, and should be part of everyone's program. So now specific data in heart failure patients particularly um, is more recent. Um, the 
biggest uh, study, ex excuse me, was called the Heart Failure Action Trial in 2012. Uh, enrolled more than 2,000 heart failure patients with low ejection fraction, less than 35%, and then followed them from for 12 months. And there were two, treat uh, two treatment arms. One was actually a specific exercise program compared with usual care, so going to clinic and completing cardiac rehab. So the specific treatment arm, uh, patients were given a target of reaching one uh, 90 minutes of exercise in the first three, one to three months. And after that, they were pushed to 120 minutes per week of exercise. Um, and they found that those in the treatment arm had a significant moderate reduction in their depressive symptoms at three months that then persisted at 12 months compared with those who received treatment as usual. Um, this benefit in the study actually plateaued at only 90 minutes per week of exercise. Say 90 minutes, it's still significant, but it is less than 120. So those benefits come quite early on and, and sh you should feel like it's doable. Next slide, please. Okay, so the next is about what I have to say about antidepressants. Um, the initial signal um, for antidepressant benefit in patients came in the 80s from a big trial called SAD Heart. Um, this actually had patients who uh, were had angina or were post MI. Um, some of these patients would have had heart failure too, but it wasn't explicitly stated. Um, in this trial, um, I can at least tell you that SSRIs, antidepressant medication, was they were safely tolerated. Um, the one that was used in that particular study was called sertraline, which was called Zoloft back in the day. Um, the, the very, very exciting finding in that study was that patients who were depressed, who were treated with the sertraline, um, they had a trend level significance. So not quite statistically significant, but close to getting a, a reduced cardiovascular mortality and morbidity. So that was a very exciting finding. You know, not only are they safely tolerated, maybe there's a chance you will have a reduced chance of having a subsequent heart event or stroke or, or dying. So um, that, that's the good news. So in heart failure patients specifically, you can see at the top of this slide, there are two small studies more recently um, that did kind of support this initial exciting finding. Um, patients who were depressed with heart failure were treated with a, an SSRI again. Uh, in this time, it was either paroxetine, also called Paxil or citalopram. And they found that there was a significant moderate reduction in depressive symptoms when they were treated with the antidepressant medication compared with not. Um, the bad news is that there've been some actually some super big studies recently that haven't quite replicated that finding. So um, there's the SAD heart CHF trial and the mood heart failure trial, which really were very large, robust studies that um, again, treated heart specifically heart failure patients who were depressed with an SSRI um, versus placebo and found that there wasn't a statistically significant difference and all patients, regardless of whether they got placebo or the SSRI, showed some improvement in their depression modestly with time. The reasons for that are unclear. You know, you know, patients get a lot of, there's a lot of other variables, you know, healthy diet, are they exercising? Um, is it the support they're getting from the clinic or, or a treatment team or, or their own mental health treatment? That is, that is unclear. Next slide, please. The, um, the last leg of the, uh, this, <laughs> this three-sided stool basically is psychotherapy. And I actually have much better data to present here. So um, I will start off by saying uh, at this point, the only robust psychotherapy that really has been properly clinically tested in trials is called cognitive behavioral therapy, um, which, uh, um, there are lots of other types of therapy. I just am not able to tell you about them because they haven't been robustly studied in the research literature at this point. But what I have to say is that um, it's the only one that's studied in depressed heart failure patients. And this is pretty recent data again. Um, in There are two trials. They aren't huge, but they are sort of uh, in the 100 or so patient range in terms of enrollment, and they are positive actually. So in the depression and self-care of heart failure study, 
Um, this recruited 158 patients who had both heart failure and major depression. Um, and there were two, treat two arms. One was six months of a course of cognitive behavioral therapy versus usual care, again, sort of cardiac rehab and clinic appointments. And what was found here was that the cognitive behavioral therapy treatment arm had a significant reduction in depression, in anxiety, as, as Gillian was talking about, actually, fatigue, and what that should mean is actually an improved life satisfaction, uh, sorry, um, compared with those who were receiving treatment as usual. The study did not show any difference ultimately in the physical functioning or the uh, amount of self-care that patients uh, would take of each other, of themselves, sorry. In another study, um, there was, this is a smaller study and there were four treatment arms, but 74 patients with heart failure who were depressed were enrolled in this study. Um, and they were put into four treatment arms, one treatment as usual, one exercise, one a course of CBT and one exercise plus CBT. Um, what was found in this study is that the patients who got most benefit uh, with a significant reduction in their depression received both exercise and CBT, um, followed by um, slightly less improvement in the patients who got either exercise or CBT. And the final was um, treatment as usual, who didn't get as much of an improvement, although they got some improvement over time in their depression. Um, in terms of what I really want you to take home, it is that exercise is really, really important. Um, psychotherapy looks like, you know, the more we're learning about it, that's also highly beneficial. Jury is still out for SSRI treatments, although I can tell you at the very least they're safe and won't make matters worse. Potentially, there's a small chance, small signal, they may improve cardiovascular outcomes as well. Um, and, you know, in conclusion, um, how can I put it? <laughs> it's extremely important to take care of your mental health because you are going to do better or um, if, you, if you take charge of it. Um, the person who'll suffer is, is going to be you or, or the loved one with heart failure who you, you see as depressed. So it's just a, a plea to take it seriously and to really take care of your mental health. It is very, very important. Okay. On that note, I'll, I'll end and thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Raj. Always a pleasure to hear you speak and, and thank you for those final words. Uh, you, you know, like I said, it's, it's often overlooked our, our own mental health and we need to take care of ourselves for that. So I really appreciate your conversation. I'm sure there'll be some questions at the end of the webinar. Thank you so much. You're welcome, Mark. Pleasure. And I will ask now Dr. Lau to step on and start your camera and your audio, please. Looks like your slide is already up. Perfect. Thank you so much. Dr. Lau is a health psychologist who's been working at the Cardiology and Heart Surgery Services of the University of Montreal Hospital Centre for the past 20 years. After completing her graduate studies in clinical research psychology, she completed a postdoctoral training in the treatment of personality disorders. She is also trained in biofeedback and cardiac coherence. She offers psychological care to cardiac patients who have difficulty adapting to their condition and who present with complex and rare diseases in acute care, as well as cardiac rehabilitation. She also, has clinical, she also is a clinical supervisor for doctoral trainees in clinical psychology, as well as medical and mental health workers. Throughout her career, she became actively involved in hospital and provincial committees to develop psychological care for cardiac patients, as well as prevention and health promotion for this particular clientele. She also gives courses, training sessions, and conferences to graduate students, medical and mental health care workers on health psychology and personality pathology. Dr. Liu, my pleasure to pass it over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Baines. Well, I'm very happy to be with you today to talk about a theme, the psychological adaptation to heart failure that is present in my everyday work with my um, heart failure patients, which I find very courageous and very resilient in dealing with their, uh, in dealing with their illness. Okay. okay, so I have no conflict of interest to divulge. Next slide. Okay, so as you all know, heart failure is a very complex disease with multiple causes, trajectories, and challenges. Our patients have to deal with a lot of stressors, including physical discomfort and pain, the morning of their cardiac health, 
complex treatments, multiple hospitalizations, which um, have uh, an impact on their daily lives and routines, uh, may have an impact on their uh, emotional adjustment to the illness, may provoke sadness, depression, anxiety, and sleep disorders. And the common de denominator here is uncertainty, as very well underlined by Jillian earlier, all of our patients have to deal with uncertainty in every aspect of their lives. So next slide. So needless to say uh, that the uh, psychological adaptation to heart failure is a very difficult challenge for most because our patients have to learn to deal about a complicated illness and challenging treatments in a very short amount of time. Often they need to accept their limits to mourn learn to cope with a new way of living with uncertainty. Uh, and a lot of them are challenged with the fear of death, uh, especially when confronted with heart attacks or with surgeries or with transplant. They may also develop possible reactions to past unresolved developmental experiences. For example, if they had in the past a difficult experience with hospitalization or illness. And heart failure is also a very stressful, um, very can have a very stressful impact on relationships. So we often see an exacerbation of ongoing conflicts and tensions in the family or marital relationships. And they have to deal with all of this while nurturing hope and their potential because there is still life and they need to continue living. Um, so in this context, adaptation difficulties or mental health disorders, which require prior attention and professional help may appear, such as depression and anxiety. And unfortunately, they are often insufficiently diagnosed and treated. Next slide, please. So there are several conditions, mental health conditions that require attention in HF. Most of our patients will suffer at one point of their illness trajectory, will suffer from emotional distress or adjustment disorders. Some of them, as outlined by Dr. Raj, will suffer from depression, a bit more than 20%. And as she explained, they're associated with adverse cardiac uh, evolution, increased mortality risk, and reduced quality of life. It's important to know here that women tend to be more at risk for depression in general in our society, but also in HF. So we need to pay particular attention in screening for depression in women. And current guidelines advise us to increase awareness of depression in HF. There's also anxiety disorders that are present. About 13% have a, of our patients have a formal anxiety disorder. And this is associated with compromised cardiac health, less favorable cardiac evolution as well. And we, our patients also experience sleep disorders. Next slide, please. So it's important to evaluate emotional distress regularly in our patients and to ask questions directly is crucial because there is still in our society a lot of prejudices against mental health and some of our patients may be ashamed in fact of discussing such issues with us. So I find it useful to just ask how much distress have you been experiencing in the past week or month on a scale of zero to ten. I'd like to know as well in what spheres of their lives they've been experiencing the distress. Is it the medical sphere, the emotional sphere, occupational, etc.? This really helps in the referral process. And we have the chance in Canada to live in a multicultural uh, country. And, uh, and it's very important to be aware and sensitive to cultural background because every culture has his or her own perception of illness. So as uh, clinicians, we need to, um, to offer personalized treatments to our patients. Next slide, please. I find it's useful to have in mind key moments to evaluate psychological distress for heart failure patients, moments where they are bound to feel more stressed out because of, of investigations, treatments, or course of illness. So we might want to look at uh, distress at the beginning or the initial uh, investigations for the diagnosis of HF um, during the treatment course, for example, at the beginning of treatment or um, during um, uh, when patients are confronted with surgeries or uh, ICD implantations or if they, they live uh, shocks of their ICD and during the course of illness. So for example, during the hospitalization, when they're confronted with cardiac events such as a heart attack 
uh, when they need a heart transplant and when they undergo that very challenging process or when they're confronted with end-of-life issues. Next slide, please. So as an HHF patient, how can you know if you're suffering from depression? Well, to have a formal diagnosis of depression, you need to have a combination of five of those symptoms, including one or, um, one or two of the first two symptoms. So significant and continuous sadness and despair and a loss of interest and pleasure. And you need to have a combination of five of those symptoms during most part of the day during at least two weeks to get the diagnosis. Next slide, please. So Dr. Raj has done a really good job in introducing the patient health questionnaire too. Next slide, please. As well as the patient health questionnaire nine, which are very useful tools uh, that were validated in HF uh, populations to screen for depression. Um, so next slide. So when is it important to ask for help if you think you may be suffering from depression? Well, if you experience multiple signs, including sadness and or loss of interest and pleasure for at least two weeks, and if you, your capacity to do your daily routine or daily activities and your quality of life are compromised, very important to ask for help. So it's important to rapidly talk about your symptoms to your medical team that will refer you to self-care, so psychoeducation and life habit modification, and uh, to psychotherapy and possibly um, a refill to, uh, to a psychiatrist to get a prescription for antidepressants. If you experience suicidal ideation, it's very important not to stay alone with, with them, to consult rapidly. There are hotlines across Canada to go to the emergency room or to call 911 is crucial and to act rapidly. Next slide, please. So what can you do as an HF patient to take care of yourself while living with your illness? Next slide, please. So the, the basic mindset here is to develop active coping strategies and problem-focused strategies as well, rather than emotional coping such as denial or avoidance. The research has shown that active coping is associated with greater psychological well-being and really helps in a successful ma management of HF. So for example, if you have heart pains or that could be a heart attack, it's important to go rapidly to the emergency room rather than staying at home and waiting for the symptoms to go away. Important to be active because every minute counts to preserve the heart muscle. It's important to develop flexibility when using the coping strategies because they may not all work for every situation and you may want to change them over time. It's important to be proactive, to ask for help, to be kind to yourself because it's not a performance. It takes time to change life habits and to develop good coping strategies. And important as well to avoid overloading yourself and respect your limits. You're the, you're the best person to know about your limits and to inform your entourage about it. Next slide, please. So in the physical sphere, how can you take care of yourself? Well, it's important to protect your health no matter what, to follow medical advice to the letter. This is a way of gaining control of things that you can have control over. To become an expert of your condition, research has shown that the patients who know more about their illness tend to fare better in the long run. To take your medication, to track your response, to take notes, this is an active way of becoming involved in your treatment and to become an active partner of your care with your team. To ask for help and consult your medical team in the emergency when needed. To stay active, physical activity is a recognized treatment of depression. It's important to talk to your medical team about how to remain safely active, and usually they will prescribe mild to moderate physical activity and refer you to cardiac rehab when available. It's important to protect your rest and sleep. It's important for your heart health, but they also 
uh, prevent anxiety and depression and to avoid cigarettes, alcohol and recreational drugs to deal with stress as well. Next slide, please. Um, how can you take care of yourself? Uh, in the psychological sphere. Well, it's impo important to accept that you're, fe you're feeling, what you are feeling, sorry, without judgment. All emotions are legitimate. So for example, if you're feeling angry, it's good to know because it usually tells us that somebody is impeding on our personal boundaries. So we need to take action to make sure that we're respected, for example. It helps to understand what lies behind. So if you're sad, it's important to know, is it because you're mourning your, your um, health uh, your cardiac health, or is it because you have to deal with a challenging procedure coming along? So that will soothe you. It's important to learn to soothe yourself um, in different ways. So to maintain a reassuring daily routine, that's really helpful for children, but also for, for adults. It's important to reduce the hyperactivation of your nervous system. So several strategies here, abdominal breathing is wonderful, relaxation, yoga, qigong, physical activity as well and Shinrin Yoku, which are the, um, the walks in nature that were developed by the Japanese. And the research, research show that they have quite a positive impact on uh, general health, stress reduction, and the immune system. To reduce helplessness and accept that you can't control everything. To cultivate and savor positive emotions. So for example, I like the gratitude exercise. You can think at night about three things during the day for which you're grateful and to really savor that moment, and to keep in touch with your family and friends, avoid isolating yourself and reach out. Very, very, very important, as uh, Jillian made the point in her presentation. Next slide, please. So in the spiritual sphere, um, it can be useful to give up control over what you can't control, to try to give a meaning to your experience according to your values, your standards and aspiration. Nobody deserves to uh, get a diagnosis of HF and you certainly don't need to have a diagnosis of HF to learn or to grow in life. But since you're confronted with it, it's helpful to know, to, to learn what you can learn from it and, and to, to find a way to grow with the experience. I, I remember a patient of mine who, uh, who, who was very emotional when he, uh, after his transplant, he told me that he never knew how courageous and resilient he could be. Another one, um, after a long stay in the intensive care, told me how he learned that his family loved him because they stood by him no matter what. It's also important to strive to see the good in yourself and others, to enhance your sense of connectedness, to think about the fact that we are part of a larger community and that's very important in times of COVID and to, to see that humans have lived similar challenges for decades. So to, to learn about past experience and, uh, and people around you who live through the challenge of uh, heart failure as well. And also to maintain a sense of purpose might be helpful. I have a patient who had to leave a job that he really enjoyed and he found a new sense of purpose in involving himself in his relationships with his grandsons. Uh, another patient of mine uh, had the dream of becoming an artist, so she took the opportunity to paint and became an active member in a community, which really gave a new sense of purpose in her life despite the heart failure. Next slide, please. So these are helpful tools to help you uh, meditate uh, and relax. Um, so find out which one uh, is more uh, uh, is better for you. Uh, your personal experience is uh, important to take into account. The Kordak coherence uh, sites are, are great too, such as the Heart Math Institute. You can find some very useful information. Next slide, please. Um, so, um, I, I see the time is running, so I'll have to go fast on this one, but it's, it's very important to ask psych for psychological help when you feel you need it. Um, if you have difficulty accepting your diagnosis, if you have uh, depression or anxiety symptoms, if you suffer because of your illness, uh, if you feel the need to do so, it's a sign of courage uh, and not of weakness. 
Next slide, please. Next, okay. Um, it's important to be an advocate for your own mental health. So here are a few strategies. So to accept your own limitations and mental health issues with kindness and without judgment, to voice your mental health problems to your entourage, to talk about your mental health issues with your medical team, and to accept the help. It's a sign of courage, remember. Next slide, please. As clinicians, we can also advocate for the mental health of our patients. So to fight prejudices against mental health in our own teams is important. To keep an open mind and non-judgmental stance when our patients can find about their mental health. To assess psychological well-being and symptoms in our patients on a regular basis. To address mental health care in our interdisciplinary meeting, we are the patient's voice and to accept our own limitations and mental health issues with kindness and without judgment. Next slide, please. So um, I want to leave you with a wonderful quote from Leonard Cohen. There is a crack in everything. That is how the light gets in. So there is hope and resiliency despite the many challenges of heart failure. So for clinicians, it's important to recognize and evaluate emotional distress on a regular basis with our patients and to refer when needed and to be an advocate for your patient's mental health. And for patients suffering from heart failure, it's important to monitor your emotional state and ask for help when needed, and to develop an active coping strategy to ensure well-being and successful management of your illness. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Liu. Appreciate it. I'll ask all the uh, speakers to turn on their cameras and mics, please. That was a fantastic, uh, talk there, Dr. Liu, is that last line, I mean, it cracks in everything and that's how light gets in. Uh, you know, I, I don't do that justice, but I mean, uh, amazing. There's, there's always a light at the end of the tunnel. And I think with some of the tools and resources we got here, you definitely add to that support. Thank you. Um, okay, so we don't have very much time, but I'm going to pass it over to some questions here. Um, one very important question that I, I would like to ask for all the panelists this content um, in the webinar, the discussions around depression, uh, emotional and, and psychological stress, it may have been triggering for some of the attendees. So can you offer some tips or some resources that they can look into for their debrief after the webinar wraps up? Okay. Um, well, um, can I speak? Yeah, please go ahead, Dr. Liu. Okay, so if the, the presentations have triggered some, some stress or anxieties, the important is to probably first thing talk to their teams about, uh, about what is bothering them, uh, uh, you know, if they have concerns about their, uh, their, you know, suffering from depression or anxiety in their own teams for mental health, that may be, uh, that may be interesting. Um, if they have uh, some, um, Patients um, in French, we call them patient partenaire, patients uh, partner, patients, or I don't know in English how you call them, uh, that they can reach out to talk about their experience and find out if if they have some specific resources. I have a lot of resources in Quebec, but I understand that the presentation is uh, is given throughout Canada, so I don't want to give specific um, referrals for Quebec. So I guess to talk about uh, their issues with their teams might be the best uh, best way. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Raj, anything to add there? So specifically just watching the presentation. So, I mean, I think the question, the key question is why? Um, is it resonating with you in some way? And I think the real overarching message is, um, you know, you already know to take this seriously. If you need help, please go and find it mental health wise. Um, so ask yourself why you have been triggered. And, um, and and get help if you need it is really the biggest message I would want to say, you know. Uh, thank, thank you so much, that question of why. Uh, Dr. Code. Uh, thank you, Mr. Baines. <laughs> um, the, I would recommend, um, in addition to what, um, what has already been said, that to reach out, you can uh, come to the HeartLife community as well. Um, you know, there's lots of people there. Um, we have, uh, um, but also the community of uh, survivors group 
um, that uh, that Heart and Stroke runs, um, as well as the Canadian Women with um, Medical Heart Issues, uh, run by by Jackie Ratz. And there's uh, there's there's a lot of people out there who have had some challenging experiences. And you know, um, it's it's all of these spaces are no judgment. So reach out, and you can get some peer support um, in the meantime. But also people across it's for, for people across the country, and so they might have some suggestions about how you can um, access uh, services in your area um, and so all of these all of these pieces are, are, are really really important and, and I think the message that we want to leave you with is that you are not alone and uh, you are not alone in this experience you are not alone in in uh, the chaos that heart failure has has created in your mind and 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 in your life and so um, there are people who who can help and you just need to reach out and um, that part is hard but it's uh, it's extremely important. Thank you, Dr. Code. I think that's um, a wonderful message to end today's presentation on. Um, we have the communities and the HeartLife app that Dr. Code was alluding to on the screen here for you. Um, some of the other questions that did come in were answered throughout the presentation. And if you do have any additional questions, please feel free to reach out and we can connect you with the proper um, the proper uh, presenter to get you the right answers that you need. Um, so a reminder that this presentation is recorded. You can go back and review at any time. We apologize for the tech, uh, tech difficulties. And then um, just wanted to put out a reminder that Heart Failure Awareness Week is May 2nd till 8th, and there's some, um, some great activities happening. Mark, did you have anything else you wanted to add? Uh, you know, you know, just, uh, you know, again, you know, Heart Failure Awareness Week, thanks for alluding to that. I mean, join the various conversations. These, these slides will be shared on the YouTube pages, respectively. The groups are there for support. Uh, as Jillian alluded, you're not alone in this. Um, Heart and Stroke Foundation, Heart Life Canada are here to help you along the way. Thank you to all of our speakers, all of our attendees, uh, an amazing session. And I look forward to the next one. Thank you, everyone.